You are listening to the Intrepid Radio Program with Scotty Roberts. Intelligent Talk. Well, happy hump day, folks. It's Wednesday. This is Scotty Roberts. You're listening to my show, the Intrepid Radio Program, right here on the Odyssey Radio Network. And that's O-D-Y-S-Y-1 dot com if you want to go over and listen to the audio stream that broadcasts out to their own network plus several other internet networks, iHeartRadio, iTunes, uh, Spreaker, all of those, as well as 26 different terrestrial stations around the nation. And, of course, this is an international show, so we've got listeners all over the globe. And I want to thank you for joining me here tonight. If you haven't yet, go over and check out my YouTube stream, where we simulcast a visual video uh, broadcast of this show. Sometimes it's really full of fun uh, treats and nuggets where I show pictures of things and diagrams, and sometimes it's just you get to look at my mug as I'm talking, but the most important feature over there is the live chat room where all the other intrep heads gather and they share their ideas about the show, about the topic, and about many other things in the live chat room. And so come on over to youtube.com slash Mr. Scotty Roberts and join in the fun over there. And tonight we're going to kind of pick up where we left off. I mean, uh, this series could go on forever, uh, only because there is so much. So let's start changing the semantics of it and not call it a series. We're just doing topic after topic after topic on looking at historical Christianity and looking at paganism, looking at how they blend and so on. Now, that isn't what this show all by itself is all about. All about all kinds of other things, but this is the positive rut I am stuck in right now. I want to go through material in all of this stuff, and pretty soon we'll probably punctuate it with some other things, uh, things I want us to talk about. But uh, for right now, we're kind of right here, and I want to stick to this, and I want us to uh, uh, get a real feel for this material, only because I want you, as well as me, to be able to look at this stuff and ask the important questions. And, of course, the question it keeps boiling down to, which I think is a very important question for us, is why do I believe what I say I believe? And this goes to the tone of your spirituality. And your spirituality is who you are in life. Now, I've said, if you were raised Christian and you go to church every now and then. Maybe you're a faithful church attender. Maybe you go every now and then. Maybe you go on holidays and things like that. But you will claim the label Christian. I'm Christian, or I'm Catholic, or I'm Lutheran, or I'm, you know, Baptist, or whatever the uh, the, the name might be. The question I need to ask you is, why are you that? Does your life, your lifestyle, your spirituality how you approach everything in your life, line up with what a Christian lifestyle is supposed to be. And I'm not talking about the grocery list that some uh, uh, churches will give you on how you're supposed to live, a legalistic list. I'm talking about what are the things that epitomize a Christian lifestyle. If you were, to, If I was to call myself Christian, if you were, what is it about Christianity that comes out in your day-to-day life? other than saying, well, I go to church on Sunday sometimes. I mean, so what? It's like I've said, I could stand in my garage for three weeks and I will not become a car. So being at church doesn't have a damn thing to do with your inner spirituality. What's inside? And does what's inside emanate to the outside? Do people look at you and go, yeah, that guy's a Christian. Uh, And I'm not talking about, maybe it's because in our society, uh, we have dumbed down what a Christian is. Uh, Christians are are weird people 
who uh, dress funny, say funny things, don't swear, don't drink beer, don't dance, go, don't go to movies. That's what it used to be epitomized as in the 70s and the 80s when I was growing up. But what is it about a Christian lifestyle? Do you want to be known as a Christian if you're Christian? If you're pagan, do you want to be known as that? And we don't, there doesn't seem to be so much problem with other religions and other forms of spirituality, but there seems to be this huge problem in Christianity that, that people, uh, well, yeah, I'm a Christian, but, you know, I'm not a Bible thumper or anything. You know, we got to qualify it. Um, or you could say, ah, yeah, I'm a pagan, but, you know, I don't believe in all those gods and stuff, and I don't go shaking trees for acorns. You know, things like that. There's mocking ways to approach it and realistic ways to approach it. What are you? Why do you believe what you believe? That's really why I'm doing this. And yeah, there's all kinds of different topics we can talk about. I could get into politics today if I wanted to. I'm not gonna. Um, because that's not for this show. That's not what I want to talk about here. Unless you ask for it. You ask for it. I'll go into it. But I'm going to stay away from that because we're inundated with politics every day. Let's uh, move on to other things. I could talk about ghosts. I could talk about Star Trek. I could talk about all these other things. Uh, science fiction. I could talk about, you name just about any topic. History, archaeology. There are lots of things to talk about. And uh, yet, I'm stuck on this because I think these are things we need to look inward and ask ourselves. When I said I was going to do a radio show every day, I said, I will only do a radio show if I believe in my heart that I, it can be worthwhile and that it gives something that people want to hear and want to know. And, uh, and sometimes you have to take the good with the bad with that because you go, yeah, I want to hear this series, but then you hear something you don't like or you disagree with or, or maybe hits home or something. Don't let that throw you off. Just enjoy it and take it for what it is. Look inward and make your own... Oh, changes if you need changes. Uh, uh, go by your own perceptions. If you have a question of anything I say, though, you can contact me and ask me. And we'll go from there. And if you've got some other topics that you'd like to hear covered on this show, eh, let me know. We'll do it. But for now, let's get back into the material. And we left off yesterday kind of talking about all this stuff about... Um, we were talking about... Um, uh, how would I how would I label what we've talked about? Looking at the different gods, looking at the different things that were carried over from ancient god men into the Christian movement. We're still really under that big umbrella in topics here of overviewing Christianity. And so I wanted to start looking at symbols today. Symbols, and we're going to morph into some other things as well. But the discussion of religious symbols... And symbolism could fill a book all by itself. Uh, but I'm going to limit this right now to the Christian symbol for Jesus. What do you think that was? I know we've seen the big fish, the ichthys, as it's pronounced. Um, uh, we've also seen the X. X was the Greek. In the Greek, it was an abbreviation for Christ, the Christos. And so let's look at that. Um, and then it's bisected, the X is bisected with the upright line, or the P you sometimes see in there. And this was a symbol that was first discussed by Plato in his Timaeus. When explaining why, explaining why the earth is round, Plato said that God made it that way because the circle is the most perfect shape and most like himself. That's what Plato said. God then placed the soul in the center of the world. Then God decided to express himself in physical form. He decussated in the form, decussated in the form of the letter X. So, Proclus, a commentator on Plato, see, even the ancients had their critics and their commentators, explains this by saying that the world is two circles. One is the circle of the equinoxes and the solstices which remain always the same, and the other is the zodiac, which is always changing. And so these two cross each other in the form of an X. It's like, get an idea of, uh, if you've seen the symbol for an atom with all the ovals, it's really supposed to be round circles that all circle around each other. With the X, you're looking at 
uh, straight on sideways of two concentric circles that cross each other. Uh, and this, uh, uh, these two cross each other in the form of an X for the equinoctial circle does not cut the zodiac at right angles. And uh, indeed, if you lay out the wheel of the zodiac in its proper alignment, with Aries in the first house, the dates of the solstices and the equinoxes connect with each other in an X shape rather than a plus sign. Uh, on such a wheel, the spring equinox falls at 8 o'clock, which would be, uh, if you're looking here, over here, 8 o'clock. And the fall equinox at 2 o'clock. And the summer solstice is at 4 o'clock. And the winter solstice is at 10 o'clock. So speaking metaphorically then, the X represents the points where what is always changeable and what never changes intersect. So what always changes and what never changes intersect in these two circles that are crossed together. And so the connection point between the heavens, the zodiac, and the earth, the seasons, is where you see the X come into play. So understanding this, we can grasp Plato's meaning when he says that the X represents the divine expressed in the physical world. So that's the point where the earth and the heavens meet or cross. So when the early church father, Justin Martyr, the same time, the same guy who called all the pre-God men uh, diabolical mimicry, says that the X symbol is the Son of God placed crosswise in the world. We understand his meaning. Jesus as the X represents the eternal intersecting of the temporal, as well as the pagan system on which his comment is based. So the two basically mean the same thing. Except Justin Martyr was appointing Christ to that, Jesus Christ. Now, this form of the cross isn't solely Platonic, but also Egyptian in its origin. Not just Plato's stuff, Egyptians had this too, which should be no surprise to any of us seeing that Plato studied in Egypt. So pictures of the Egyptian god Amon show this symbol on his breast, the X. Lundy says the Christians added the upright line, almost like an asterisk, but it doesn't have the horizontal line, uh, to represent Jesus, the upright line. But this form of the symbol is also found on coins and medals before the time of Jesus, before the church ascribed this symbology to him. Even the X with the P at the top, you've seen that, uh, is thought to be exclusively Christian. It's found on coins of of the Ptolemies and of the Herods, pre-Jesus. So some of this, symbolog this symbology that you see that's out there, one of the most common forms, it has its pagan roots. And uh, it's been borrowed over and brought over and made to really coincide, and they really try to express the same thing. Now get into the, uh, the passion of Jesus, the resurrection, the ascension, Dionysus is pictured in inscriptions as riding a donkey on the way to his death. <clears throat> At his festival, an image of Dionysus was set in a basket on the donkey, while the crowds shouted his praises, waved bundles of branches. And in a similar matter, the festival of Attis. Think of the Attis bull uh, when you're talking about Mithras. Uh, began on March 22nd with the entrance of the reed-bearers, followed by the entrance of the tree, on which an image of Attis was tied. Uh, I've got this thing sitting here, um, back here. It's been on my shelf for a long, long time. Now, this is, uh, some people will look at this, and they think, and sorry, those on the radio, you aren't going to be able to see this, just those in the chat room. Uh, this little image here is supposed to be Jesus on the cross. Yet they show him hung on a tree. And this is something I picked up at a garage sale. I don't know where it was made. I thought it was Mexican, but I might be wrong. Um, but this is actually a symbol of Attis, hung on the tree. And look at the similarities you see there to Jesus. So, uh, you've got Attis on the tree. And... Uh, um, so while they show him on the donkey, they put an image of him, 
They have the tree at his festivals and so on. Uh, Attis was tied to the tree. Likewise, Jesus entered Jerusalem. What, what? Riding a donkey from the Jericho Road coming in. Uh, while the crowd cast reeds, palm fronds, palms, branches before him on the ground, yelling Hosanna to the king. The pine tree on which Attis was tied was then buried in a tomb and left. But on the third day, after night had fallen, the tomb was open, and Attis was proclaimed to be risen from the dead. The priests of Attis touched the lips of each person present with balm and a salve of sorts, and spoke the glad news of salvation to them. On the morning of March 25th, which was reckoned as the vernal equinox, Attis's divine resurrection was celebrated with great joy by all the people that were at this gathering. And in Rome, this celebration eventually took the form of a carnival and became the Hilaria, or the Festival of Joy. In Euripides' play, The Bacchae, which we've mentioned in this series before, was written five centuries before the birth of Jesus. Dionysus is imprisoned. He's brought to the king to be tried. The guards tell the king wonderful things about Dionysus and say, Master, this man has come here with a load of miracles. The king interrogates Dionysus, who replies, Get this, nothing can touch me that is not ordained. And you know not what you're doing, nor what you're saying, nor who you are. Jesus' trial and passion contain similar characters and dialogue. They brought him before Pilate, the governor. And he says, I hear all these things about you. He says, and yet you're, you're not answering my questions. Don't you know that I have the power to put you to death and the power to set you free? And Jesus said, you would have no power at all against me unless it was not given to you by my Father in heaven. In other words, these things are ordained by God. And so the followers of Mithras also celebrated communion, which consisted of water mixed with wine and bread of wafers marked with a cross. And uh, I just got to make sure I got my time right here for today. I don't want to go over time like I did yesterday, about 10 minutes. So... Um, on a temple inscription, Mithras says, He who will not not eat of my body and drink of my blood, so that he will be made one with me and I with him, the same shall not know my salvation. So the church just, the father, Justin Martyr again, accused the Mithraists of mimicking the Eucharist as their rites and used the phrases, This is my body, this is my blood. Do this in commemoration of me, which is what Jesus said at the Last Supper. It's unclear who might have been mimicking whom, as this rite existed before the time of Jesus in the worshippers of Mithras. But apparently it wasn't the only mimicking that was going on, as the Christians adopted the shepherd's crook of the Mithraic bishops, you know, the big crook with the kind of a C on the top of it, the shepherd's crook, and then a little hook off the end of that. Um... They adopted the shepherd's crook of the Mithraic bishops. And their hat, known as the mitre, came from mit, mitra, or mithra, M-I-T-H-R-A, from M-I-T-R-E, the mitre hat that the Pope wears. And you see bishops wearing sometimes. This came from the mithra. And it was used um, uh, by, the, by Mithras, worn by Mithras. You also see lots of old inscriptions of the gods, the ancient gods, who wore the same type of hat. You had Owenes, uh, the half-fish, half-man god uh, uh, that came up out of the Euphrates River and taught the people. He wore like a fish head with the mitre-style hat and the skin that came down as a robe. Uh, that's what the priests would wear. So also the highest initiatory grade in the Mithric Mysteries was called the Pater, or the Father. And one who reached this grade acted as the head of the congregation and supervised the offerings made in the temple. So you see, the Catholic Church mimicked what was in the earlier religions. They brought that stuff over from the mystery religions and incorporated it into Christianity in the early years. This tells you something. 
that the earlier believers saw this as just another form of these religions. And so the theme of resurrection was common in uh, religions of the era uh, of the area and of the era. And the resurrection festival of Osiris was spread over three days, with his death being mourned on the first and his resurrection on the night of the third. And the priests would herald his resurrection with the shout, Osiris has been found! And New Testament scholar G.A. Wells refers to the image of Osiris as a mummy with a stalk of corn growing from his mummified body, indicating that new life would spring out of the death. And so the Feast of Adonis also observed a three-day resurrection period. An image of Adonis was first washed, anointed with spices, wrapped in linen or wool, and then laid in a coffin. And this coffin was carried to his grave. And uh, the pagan writer Lucian records that they make offerings to Adonis, Adonis as to one dead. And the day after the morrow, they tell the story that he lives. So according to the Phoenician version of this story, on the third day, he was resurrected and ascended to heaven. So uh, here, here's something from historian James Bonwick. Um, he explains the connection to the three days for the resurrection period this way. But the sun appears to die and rise again at the solstice. For instance... On our shortest day, December 21st, the sun descends its lowest on the southern side. It's our depth of winter, our dead of the sun. For three days, the sun appears to stand still, that is, rising each morning at the same place, without advancing. Then it exhibits sudden vitality. It leaves its grave, December 25th, reborn and progresses upward, day by day toward us in the northern hemisphere. And at the equinox, say the vernal, at uh, Easter, the same phenomenon occurs. The sun has been below the equator and suddenly rises above it to our natural rejoicing. It's been, as it were, dead to us, but now exhibits a resurrection. And it's that three days where it stops and starts to work its way back that is that period from death to resurrection. Same thing with Jesus. The followers of Mithras also celebrated his resurrection, after which Mithras um, ascended to heaven in a sun, a chariot, and was enthroned as the ruler of the world. It was believed that he waits in heaven for the end of time, when he will return to wake the dead and pass judgment. So concerning the last judgment, James Bonwick, this same commentator, uh, a historian, says... Um, that a pursual of the 25th chapter of Matthew will prepare the reader for the investigation of the Egyptian notion of the last judgment. Go read Matthew 25, and you'll find out the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, and uh, it's going to prepare you for the notion of the last judgment because they are so closely related. So, what do you think of that? we got to go out to break for two minutes. We'll be right back, so you sit tight.
All right, folks, we're back. Thank you for sitting on through the break. This is Scotty Roberts. You're listening to the Intrepid Radio Program right here on the Odyssey Radio Network, ODYSY1.com. And you're watching the video simulcast over on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Mr. Scotty Roberts. So come on over, enjoy the chat room, join with people, subscribe to my channel, like the video, and enjoy it with other people of like mind over there that are discussing this stuff. So, what do you think? Is this all a lie of Satan? Is this all diabolical mimicry? Is this all the stuff of... I don't know. Is this all the stuff of some satanic being that is able to mimic ahead of time? everything that Jesus was said to have become? Or is this his followers that were so uh, used to, uh, so familiar with for centuries the pagan mysteries that they saw Jesus as another symbolic God-man, not literal, and but yet they made him into that and then made him into the literal God-man. They turn the mythology into actual history. What do you think? How does this stuff grab you when you start to see this stuff? Let's move on. I'm going to just pick up right where we left off because there's so much material here that uh, I'd like to get through it. And uh, so, and I, I uh, uh, just want to make sure that uh, I am, uh, yeah, right where we need to be, I am, on time i got to watch my clock, because I could go off and talk a blue streak and three hours later realize I'm two hours over. So uh, let's get back into it. So uh, concerning this last judgment, uh, we ended with talking about go read Matthew 25. And you're going to get an idea of how close all of this stuff is to uh, with the, the, the sun in the heaven, the ascending of the chariot, the three days of resurrection, and all of this stuff, you're going to see how closely they're related to the Egyptian and to these pagan mysteries. And so um, the idea of an atonement was well established in Egypt religion uh, for several thousand years. The atonement of sin. We're told that Jesus died on the cross to atone for our sin, to cover our sin, to take it on himself. Uh, the propitiation is also used in there. Four gods of the dead accompanied the deceased to a trial before judges. Sometimes these gods, this is Egyptian I'm talking about now, present offerings to the judges on behalf of the deceased. And sometimes the gods are themselves sacrificed for them. Jesus, in Christianity, is also seen as the sacrifice that atones for sin. This is why he is called the Lamb of God in Christianity, because the temple worship in Judaism was salvation came for you because you were able to atone for your sins by bringing a lamb once a year to the temple for sacrifice at Passover, and that that lamb's blood being shed was what God looked at as the thing that would cover your sin. Now, explain that to me. I don't understand why God required the blood of an animal and thousands of animals for thousands of people at Passover time at the temple. Uh, why did God require blood? Like Moses' wife said to him, Surely you are a bloody husband to me. When uh, the whole circumcision in the way. We talked about that when I read through my book, uh, The Exodus Reality. But what is the purpose of the blood? It was to atone. It was to cover. Now, I don't know why that animal blood was supposed to atone for, other than it was the act that you were committing. Uh, it was bringing it to the temple. The priest would do it. And God saw this as a covering for your sin, an atonement. So Jesus is seen as that perfect Lamb of God he's referred to the one that takes away the sin of the world by the shedding of his blood, and then, of course, the resurrection, for which the death would be meaningless without the new life. 
but you see this in all the pagan mystery religions as well. So the sinner had to pass successfully through his or her judgment, and they had to atone for the sins with the blood. The dead were called the justified ones. Even as early as the 6th Egyptian dynasty, now we're talking way back, I mean we're talking, it was 18th dynasty when I'm talking about Moses in 1500, 1400 BCE. So the 6th dynasty, we're talking way back. Uh, as early as the 6th dynasty, uh, these things were seen, the dead were called the justified ones. Uh, uh, frequent references made to the crown of justification and a robe of righteousness, which you see these things mentioned in the book of Revelation and other places in the New Testament, which is given to the dead. It's symbolized by the wrappings of the mummy. Horus, who raises the mummy to its resurrected life, is called the justifier of the righteous. Similar titles and descriptions are given to Jesus in the New Testament. And uh, now, let's l l let's move this from all of this stuff into some thoughts on paganism and Christian similarities. Um, remember we mentioned Professor Geigenbert uh, a little earlier yesterday, I think it was, or the day before? He gives his opinions on the similarities between Christianity, Christianity and paganism uh, by saying that Christianity could meet and overcome the entire pagan syncretism because it had itself become a syncretism in which all the fertile ideas and the essential rites of pagan religiousness and righteousness were blended. It combined, it harmonized them in a way that enabled it to stand alone. It faced all the inchoate beliefs and practices of its adversaries without appearing inferior on any uh, vital point. So, furthermore, it's sometimes very difficult to tell exactly from which pagan rite a particular Christian rite has been derived. But it remains certain that the spirit of pagan ritualism became by degrees impressed upon early Christianity. And to such an extent that at the last whole of it, it might be found distributed through its ceremonies. You can look all through Christian ceremonies and find pagan ritual. Spiritual commentator Edward Carpenter observes that Christianity managed to persuade the general public of its own divine uniqueness to such a degree that few people even nowadays realize where it sprang from, from just the same root as paganism and that it shares by far the most part of its doctrines and rights with the latter. And so, maybe it shouldn't be surprising that there are so many similarities out there between Christianity and paganism, uh, the mystery religions and Christianity, since all of the early church fathers up to the time of Constantine were pagans. They'd been trained in one or more mystery religions. And even Constantine, who came across as the first Christian pope, the emperor of Rome, was still a, he was still a pagan. And he did not live a Christian life, or even a pagan life, really. Uh, he, was not, he was not a very, uh, he was not a very Christian Christian. Let's put it that way. Um, but they'd all been trained in the mystery of religions. The only exceptions of this was origin, uh, not origin, like origins, beginnings. Origin was his name. Uh, he comes late in the list of the church fathers. He was the first to be born of Christian parents. And except for Clement of Alexandria, all the church fathers were Greek and wrote in Greek. So they would have been very familiar with the religious systems, the syncretism, and so common in the Hellenistic world of the time. Uh, Wheelis notes that not one of these church fathers mentions the New Testament ever in those first 200 years. It didn't exist. There were a collection of writings, but they weren't canonized as Scripture. None of them quotes from a book in it, although they do quote extensively from the Old Testament. 
than the oracles given by the, the pagan Sibylus. Sibyls. Sibylus, I, I pronounced it. S-I-B-Y-L-S. Sibylus. Sibylus. The prophetess who believed foretold, uh, who was believed that foretold the coming of Jesus. And Wheelis identifies these church fathers as Clement of Rome, who lived 30 to 96 A.D., St. Ignatius, 50 to 98, these are all A.D., um, uh, St. Polycarp, Bishop of Smyrna, 69 to 155, Papias, Bishop of Hierapolis, 70 to 155, St. Justin Martyr, 100 to 165, St. Iranius, Bishop of Lyons, Lyons, um, 120 to 200. Tertullian, Bishop of Carthage, 160 to 220. Clement of Alexandria, head of the, uh, cate- uh, the, uh, the, the catechetical schools, the catechetical school in Alexandria. I think cataclysm, uh, cat- not cataclysm, uh, catechism. <laughs> wow, those two words are similar, cataclysm and catechism. Uh, he was the teacher of origin. He, was, he lived from 155 to 215, and then Origen himself, 165 to 254. And Lactantius, Lactantius was from, we don't know when he was born, but he lived to 330. And so uh, uh, there's a Christian art historian by the name of Lundy expressed his amazement that in order to study early Christian art, he had to study paganism. Uh, he said it this way, the ancient Christian monuments from which I've drawn my facts and my illustrations, several of which are set out uh, in, in uh, books that you can look at and go see all of his stuff, reveal so many obvious adaptations from the pagan mythology and art that it became necessary for me to investigate anew the pagan symbolism. Because sometimes you don't know if you're looking at Christian art or you don't know if you're looking at pagan art. They just morphed them and they borrowed from it. So uh, Lundy almost apologizes to his readers for having to spend so much time on paganism when dissecting Christian art. For it's the most singular and astonishing fact sought to be developed in this work that the Christian faith, as embodied in the Apostles' Creed, finds its parallel or dimly foreshadowed counterpart article by article in the different systems of paganism here brought under review. No one can be more astonished at this than the author himself, so said Lundy about Christian and pagan art. So what did he mean when he says that the creed is foreshadowed in the pagan religions? Carpenter, another historian, has some thoughts to share on this point. The Nicene Creed which was written during the reign of Constantine in the 4th century, is still so professed by millions of Christians today. Now, li- listen to what this says. Here's the Nicene Creed. And if you're a Catholic uh, or in Orthodox uh, uh, belief, you, you abide by the Nicene Creed. Listen to this. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in the one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, one in being with the Father, and through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. He was born of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered, died, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in fulfillment of the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, 
we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to be to come. Amen. Now, here's the similarities between the creed and paganism. And this was written by Carpenter um, in his commentary on this, his observations of this. Uh, so this is a quote. <clears throat> Here we have the All-Father and Creator descending from the sky in the form of a spirit to impregnate the earthly virgin mother, who thus gives birth to a savior hero. The latter is slain by the powers of evil, is buried and descends into the lower world, but arises again as God into heavens and becomes the leader and the judge of mankind. We have the confirmation of the church, or in the earlier times, of the tribe, which means of a Eucharist or a communion, which binds together all the members, living or dead, and restores errant individuals into... Uh, I'm sorry, through the sacrifice of the hero and the forgiveness of their sins. And we have the, re the belief in a bodily resurrection and continued life of the members within the fold of the church or the tribe, itself regarded as eternal. One has only, instead of the word of Jesus, to read the word Jesus, I'm sorry, to read Dionysus or Krishna or Hercules, or Osiris, or Attis, and instead of Mary to insert Simel, or Devaki, or Elsmein, Al uh, Alchmeni, uh, or Neith, or Nana, and for Pontius Pilate to use the name of any terrestrial tyrant who comes into the corresponding story. And lo, the creed fits in all particulars into the rites and worship of just about any pagan god-man. What does that make you think? i, I got to tell you, as I review these materials and I talk about this, it refreshes some of the things that I have researched and studied that kind of made me re-question what I believed about Christianity. Is Christianity unique? No. Christianity is paganism. All it has done is renamed the characters. That doesn't, by the way, make Jesus non-historical means the historical Jesus was pulled into a pagan reworking or a Christian reworking of a pagan God. Nothing is different. That, to me, is astounding. And I'm sorry, you probably hear it too. My phone keeps beeping in the background. I don't know where I've got it. It's somewhere around here. It's in a pocket of something. So, sorry about that. You have to put up with that. So... Let's look at, we've got a few minutes left here. We've got about six, seven minutes left of this show, this program. Uh, I want to look at, I want to start getting into these early membership structures of the church. And uh, so let's hit this. Let's see if we can get through this even today. The ancient mystery schools were divided into at least these two groups that we know of, the greater and the lesser mysteries. The lesser mysteries were open to the public. It's like going to a fellowship meeting at a Masonic hall that's open to the public. You're not brought into the mysteries, uh, the greater teachings. You're just allowed to, to uh, rub shoulders, ask questions, perhaps even be recruited. Now, the lesser mysteries open to the public were stories that would be enacted in teachings and parted, but generally the inner meaning of the rites and the symbols were not shared in early Christianity, in any of the early uh, um, mystery schools, so to speak, the Gnostic mysteries, the ancient mystery religions, the greater mysteries, as they were called, were private. Those were things that were to be admitted to them uh, that, that required long periods of probation and training. And so once a person, it's like even the Apostle Paul said, he says, when I was a young Christian, he says, I... I fed on the milk of the word. And he says, the more I grow, I feed on the meat of the word. And he says, uh, uh, I, as an adult, I no longer need the milk, the, the mom's breast milk of the baby. I've moved on to the meat. And so once a person completed this training, they could be initiated into the full meaning of the mysteries. And the philosopher Celestius 
explains the rationale for this when he says, For one may call the world a myth, in which bodies and things are visible, but souls and minds are hidden. So, besides to, to, to wish to teach the whole truth about the gods, to all produces contempt in the foolish, because they can't understand, and they lack the zeal in the good, whereas to conceal the truth by myths prevents the contempt of the fools and compels the good to practice philosophy. So the mystery schools took this approach of concealing the greater truths in myth, or in parable, in fable. And as Celestius puts it, the, the myth or the story about the gods and their doings wasn't what was true about them. And it was not the truth in and of itself, but it was the carrier for a deep, hidden truth that was revealed only when the initiate was ready for that. So you might be able to say that the story of the myth was an allegory or a metaphor, the underlying meaning of which was given only to the initiate or the initiated uh, the unintentional, uh, the uh, I'm sorry, the uninitiated may never have realized this to be the case, which ultimately is unfortunate. There were people who thought it was foolish and walked away from it. They never knew the true mysteries, the true deeper things. And since the metaphorical teachings were kept secret and therefore have been lost, so we may never know what some of these things were. The Christian historian Johann Lorenz von Maschheim states that the mystery religions were highly respected and regarded. He says that the highest veneration was entertained by the people of every country for what was termed the mysteries. And the Christians, perceiving this, were induced to make their religion conform in many respects to this part of the heathen model. And one simple example of the influence and the reputation of the mystery schools can be seen in the New Testament itself, where you, uh, you note that the words mystery or mysteries appear 28 times in the New Testament. So like the mysteries, the Christians who created a tiered structure of membership, which consisted of three classes, uh, the catechumens, the competentes, and the illuminati. The illuminati were also called the faithful or the mystae and the later term being the given name to the initiated members of the Mysteries of Eleusius. So, and, and you know, it's, it's very interesting that you can, you can see this in the New Testament. There was, uh, remember I told you all these different Gospels that were written, the 70, some 65 to 70 additional Gospels to the four that we have in Scripture. Those Gospels contained, one of them was the Gospel of Judas, where Judas isn't the bad guy, but Jesus took him aside the night of the Last Supper. And he said, he said Judas, he said, I'm going to ask you something because you, above all my other disciples, understand the mysteries. And so he told Judas, this is what you need to do. And that's a study all by itself. And so, uh, folks, we're, we're coming to the end of the show. If I start digging into other stuff uh, here, we're going to have to cut it off abruptly because I'm not going to get through the material. Um, there's a, we're, we're building up to a shift to a literalism that took over uh, in early Christianity rather than just seeing the mythologies. So do you start to understand where... There is a, mytho a mythological base that early Christianity understood, but that was soon became in Orthodox Christianity the literal history of Jesus Christ, of Christianity. So that's what we're looking at. I hope this stuff is interesting to you and makes you think. Maybe it's all washed up. Maybe it is diabolical mimicry. You decide. Satan bring all this stuff to deceive you from believing in God and Jesus? Or is this anthropological, historical, archaeological evidence that things were different than what we perceived? Folks, there it is. I'm just, uh, these are the jokes, folks. These are the jokes. Now, I'm just presenting you information. 
You can decide from there. So we got to move on. It's the end of the show. See you back here tomorrow night after 23 hours. You take care. Have a good night. Sit tight.